AskGunQuestions.com is a website that we built back in 2007. And since then, for the last 15 years, people have been able to ask questions of simple to advanced nature, and we attempt to answer them in different ways over the years. Join us now as we start a new series to answer gun questions. Yeah, welcome everybody. What's going on? Join us now as we start a new series. Where is it even open? Oh, it's over here. All right. Welcome everybody. Thank you for your patience. As I got set up here, I am going to screen share so that we can all look at a screen together. There we go. I've uh, got Clover Tech joining me today. Thanks for jumping in. Yeah, appreciate him. But you bet. So um, this is a new series on this channel for now. So we've done this in the past, and it'll probably get new innovate or new innovate. It'll iter iterate in the future. But for now, I uh, figured on Saturdays for a little bit, we'd go live and uh, work on this project again. So we're sharing the screen and we're looking at the uh, YouTube comments here. But we have a website called askgunquestions.com. It's been up since 2007. And it's basically just, uh, it's askgunquestions.com, so easy to find on the internet. And then it just has a form on there. You can ask your question. If you want to, you can leave a name. And if needed, you can leave a link. Um, it gets some spam, but most of the, well, the questions then get crammed into a spreadsheet over here. We use Google Forms. If you ever want to uh, learn about that stuff, ask me or Clover sometime. But uh, it's a pretty decent system. It allows people to ask a question pretty harmlessly, and then it goes into a database so that we can do what we're going to do right now, and that's address them. I'm going to see if I can't move over the names so it keep people a little bit more privacy. But the questions have accumulated since 2004 or 2007, I guess. And uh, somewhere around 2017, I think I moved the server, so everything kind of hiccuped. And I was just telling Clover, I think in the Daily Gun Show, we used to address the questions that came off of here for a while. And then uh, on gun channels, we had a portion of the gun channels. And I think it was, I sort of created sort of a, a open invitation for people that wanted to grab the questions and answer them. So it's just, uh, it's, an, it's an opportunity to get some questions that are all across the board and then to answer them and hopefully have some fun and open some horizons. So I wanted to bring uh, somebody in who knows a lot and on a broad depth or a lot of different topics. So thanks Clover for joining me. Um, if you're not familiar with Clover, it's Clover Tech over on YouTube and every other platform. And I think I'll move us out of here. You don't need to show us. And that will give people, can I make this bigger? Make this as large as possible. I figured what we do um, is go live for a little while, see what kind of response we get. Uh, my interest is doing things that are participatory. So if you look at the screen, about a quarter of the screen over here is devoted to the people that are watching this live uh, to participate. And we've put out links to the Patreons if they want to jump in and be part of the answering side of it. They're welcome. Uh, like I say, I'm kind of developing this here as like a new iteration of the Ask Gun questions. So I figured what we would do is answer a couple of these questions that have come in recently and then maybe jump to the other end back to the beginning of 2017. And I'm guessing this color code is some of the stuff we've addressed on previous shows and stuff, but maybe hit some random ones. Uh, we could do a search. This is a database after all. So we could do a search if someone's got a specific question. But there's hundreds of questions in here, so uh, we can have some fun. And we're never going to hit them all, so we can do this um, weekly or every other week or something going forward. So we're looking for some feedback on it. Uh, with that, you got any questions, Clover? You want to add anything before we dig in? No, let's do it. All right, so the first one is the last one came in. It says, can a Nikon P-Tactical Spur Optic fit on a Canik TP9SC? So that's why I had to bring people in. Uh, I barely know what a Canik TP9SC is. So first I'll ask Clover, do you know what that is? Do you know what we're talking about? Yeah, we're talking about a, we're talking about a handgun. Yeah, right, right. I mean, you're familiar with this model? Yes. And then have you ever heard of a Nikon P Tactical Spur? Yes. And that's a red dot. That's so do you know? Is there an answer to that one? Does it fit? Uh, the question is with the right plate, yes. 
Okay, so that's what we're talking is on the Canic, a lot of the new guns have a piece of the slide milled away so that a plate can be put on there and that plate will have a different pattern for the various holes or circle or screws that the uh, red dots will need. So some sort of interface, something that'll clamp to the gun and then create an interface to the optic. And then is that something that like Canic makes or is that something that Nikon makes or is that something like a third party will create? Um, that would be likely a third party thing. And that's kind of cool because um, that's why the industry is so vast. We've got the manufacturers out there that are developing tech such as firearms, handguns, and optics, right? But they may not know about every handgun, like the optic company Nikon might not know about every handgun. Likewise, the handgun company can't know what every optic might be. But anybody with a, well, not everybody, but a lot of people with mills and technical knowledge and a, you know, knack for using 3D software or whatever it would be, can create the interface. And then again, people in their garage or in a small shop can pop these things out. And now you've got a new piece of, in, a new you know company that's providing this, or a company has a new division that provides these. And um, now, are you familiar by any chance with a company that actually makes that interface or maybe point somebody in a direction without doing a little bit of a uh, little bit of digging. No, I, I can tell you that the Nikon is not um, like standard RMR. So that's why I said, I mean, with the plate, you know, adapter thing. Yes. But uh, outside of that, is it bolt on? No. Okay. And that's another aspect to this that you brought up because there are sort of more common or like more popular, more, widely distributed optics and same with guns. So right. some of the things are like a no brainer, a Glock with an aim point. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you could, you don't know, but you probably can tell. Well, and, but some, this is a little bit more fringe or a little bit more yeah. potential. Yeah. Well, and the, and the question wasn't, it didn't say, will it mount with no adapter? All it said is, can he put one on there? Right. And it, there's a difference between, can I do something and will it just plug and play or drop in? Right. That's two different, that's two different questions in my mind. So, you know, the answer to the, the basic question there is yes, with proper adapter. Yes. Um, if it's a plug and play, you know, easy couple of screws, the, the answer is no. Okay. Well, that's a good way to answer it too. And so yes, with an interface, no alone. But right. There's really no optic that's going to fit on almost any handgun alone. They all are made to fit their interface plate, right? Right. Unless there just happens to be an optic that happens to mount up with somebody's plate. And then even well, then you'd probably miss a quarter inch or whatever, not a quarter inch, but you know, you'd miss that piece. Yeah. So you put a spacer in anyway. Yeah. And the, and the newer stuff, both, both on the handgun side and talking about red dot side, they're, they're moving more to the, a standardized pattern. You, you feel what I'm saying? So uh, the industry is recognizing that that's a popular thing now and they're, they are moving toward I don't, where that standardization will ultimately fall. I don't know, but they are moving uh, that direction. Well, they didn't ask this question, but that brings up something interesting. Back in the olden days, I can remember going into shops when I was first a young and, and looking at HKs like, you know, because that's what SEALs carried and that's what SAS carried. And it was, you know, not obtainable when I was a young. And, but then they had an, a proprietary optics rail. But since there was no standard optics rail, that wasn't a downside. That was just a feature that no other gun really had back in the old days. And you'd get this kind of bulb, you know, and battery garbage that compared to nowadays was almost nothing. But it was a light and it mounted to the gun and it was made by HK. So, um, you know, then we started with the 1919 rail and then little versions of that. Uh, so, yeah, that's a good point. Not, all, not everything. Um, or I guess the, the, what's the word, standardization isn't like what it used to be, where there was nothing, and then they were like, hey, why don't we put a rail on a gun? Okay, and then everybody kind of looked around and said, well, this is a standard rail in the military, let's just adopt that. And everybody agreed because there was no other options. Well, now if everyone were to say, hey, let's agree on an interface uh, you know, type of whatever uh, solution, you'd find six different solutions. So no one's even going to agree on the solution, right? So it's going to be really tough to get standardization anymore. Uh, I guess you'd have to assume that like the big companies would get together and they're never going to do that. They don't do that on handrails. They don't do that on 
I mean, almost anything except for the AR platform itself, the, the ways that things attach to the receiver of an AR. Um, you know, if that didn't exist from, you know, Stoner back in the day, uh, you know, they probably wouldn't even agree on that. They'd be making their own proprietary grips and stuff. Right. Anyway, so uh, that wasn't really asked, but it was another little angle of it. Uh, so let's dig into one right before that is I'm starting to look at guns. And, no, this was from a young kid, I think. I looked at the name on this one, and it was, what did it say, a 13-year-old. So huh. basically, some kid. So I'm, at least somebody says it's a kid, right? I'm starting to look at guns, and I want an AR-15 that is red. How much would that cost? Well, that does sound like a kid's question. So... <laughs> Basically, though, starting with, uh, let's go with the question, somebody young starting off looking at an AR-15, how much would that cost? I think it's attainable with, a, I mean, assuming a reasonable allowance or something, it's obtainable. You'd probably spend a year saving up for a rifle and get one. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you got birthday presents and Christmas presents and other things, too, is potential. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, now, you also have, you can earn it, you can shoot in a competition, right? get good and then earn one or win one you can uh, get on a team or something and earn like a place on a team and you might get sponsored with a rifle so there's some out, outside the box ways to get an ar-15 also i'm guessing you know starting out as a youngin you may want to look at something like a 22 which is uh a, a smaller caliber but um less expensive to shoot um and i don't know if they're necessarily cheaper but they're lighter weight often and you might be able to get a used 22 caliber AR platform, probably the least, maybe at least not the least, not the least expensive because that's tough to know. But at the least, and at, at the end of the, the the cheapest end of the spectrum, the least expensive end of the spectrum. Otherwise, you can get standard ARs depending on if there's a shortage or if there's a big demand for them, fairly inexpensively. As far as the red part, I mean, how many ways are there to make a gun red? Right. <laughs> Lots of different ways. So it depends on if you want to do trim, you could get some like a grip and a handguard and things like that in red. Uh, you get like things like the accessories, like the pins and the sling and, you know, accessories in red to kind of accent it. Of course, you could serrate coat or paint the whole thing red. I think. So, yeah, I, th I think I think by the time I mean, I see I see a, an issue here. So if you don't already have. Right. So I mean, it's like you. Well, you had the rifle and you just wanted it red. That's a whole different uh, ball game than I don't, but I want a red one. So by the time you would even buy, let's let's take the panic buying and the shortage and all of the mess that were have been in the last year or so. Let's take all of that completely out of the equation. Pretend that's not this. That's not the case right now. And let's talk about a four to five hundred dollar rifle. Let's say PSA. Let's say. Smith and Wesson M and P, right? Because um, that's roughly where the the bottom tier ARs were uh, prior to all of this. So let's say you do that, and then you you go, oh, well, I want it red. Well, maybe you go the route you just mentioned, where you buy red accessories to go on that, or you take it to somebody that does Cerakote and you want it done in red Cerakote. Either way, by the time you buy all those access red accessories or and have them installed if you don't have the tools and the knowledge to do this, uh, or by the time you take it and have it Cerakoted, you, you're going to put several hundred dollars into that $500 rifle. So at that point, what you have to think about is instead of buying a $500, $400, or $500 base rifle and spending several hundred dollars getting the, the look pretties and the bling and the colors that I want, what if I went to a company, let's say a Black Rain Ordnance, let's say an F1 Firearms, let's say, right, you pick your 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 deal, these quote-unquote boutique um, you know, rifle manufacturers that you could basically get theirs for around that same amount of money, eight, nine hundred, a thousand, eleven hundred dollars. And I know that's a lot if we're talking about a teenager mowing lawns or, or on a paper route. But if you're talking about spending that much money anyway, um, why not do that if you don't already have the rifle? You feel what I'm saying? Instead of buying the budget rifle and then spending all that money, why not go ahead and just opt for the boutique choice and you get the advanced parts and the advanced machining and the just the overall better quality rifle resale value i mean there's a lot of perks to that 
when you end up the bottom line, you end up spending the same amount of money. You feel what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm not going to say that like that's the way, but that's certainly a way. And I'm not going to shy away from recommending holding on to your cash and buying once, crying once type of thing. In other words, buy it one time at a real at a, at a price because you're buying quality. Cry about the price because it costs so much, but then you're done and you don't even actually think about it. And decades later, you appreciate what little you spent on it because at you know decades later when you buy quality it appreciates in value and you've right. accomplished things without wasting your time so yeah it's going to be tough then anybody's going to have to learn that i'm guessing as a young and unless they're really got some good advice you know growing up you're gonna be tempted to just buy whatever you can afford as fast but as you, you can. <laughs> but you've got a, you've got another element to that too so you mentioned a great option when it comes to you know, the red accessories go with the grip, the hand guards, the rail covers, the, you know, good Lord, you can get trigger shoes and, and dust covers and whatever it might be uh, in red castle nuts, uh, stock, yeah. whatever. Um, so if you go, if you went that route, as opposed to seracoding, the beauty of that is what happens if you need to turn around for whatever reason, cash gets tight, whatever happens. I mean, sometimes you, you grow up, your baby needs baby food or diapers. I mean, the, the water bill, the light bills do. Um, it's going to be a quicker flip if you need to sell that rifle, if it's in stock, black, regular configuration, as opposed to a bunch of red and everything else, because the person buying that may or may not like red. They may or may not care about all of that. And so you've got added cost in that. So what you could do, if you, this is why I'm a big proponent of, if you do upgrade with accessories and other things, keep your originals. That way you could always put that back into a, a, an original configuration as far as the aesthetics, as far as the way it looks. Um, and it's more appealing to a broader audience. So it's going to be a quicker flip in case you need it. Uh, and then later on, you can always use those accessories if you get another one. If we're talking AR platform, pretty standardized platform, right? So you could probably use those accessories later on when you get, if and when you get another one. Um, or you could try to turn those, sell those outright because you've recouped the bulk majority of your initial investment into that rifle. And if it takes a few weeks or months or whatever to sell the red accessories to somebody that likes red, well, so be it, because at least you've got that bulk majority of that investment back. Yeah, for sure. And if you find somebody that likes red, they might buy all those in a bulk and then you get rid of them all at once just as soon as, you know, just as potentially as having to wait a while to sell them. You never know. But no, it's a great point. You can strip them off of there. I'm going to add to that, since we're talking to a young and everybody else who's listening, um uh since like what you were saying is let's say you go the route of buying a rifle and it's just a generic black rifle or whatever and then you decide to go with accessorizing uh, unless you're not doing content creation this might not appeal to you but or i guess if you're if you're not doing content creation this might not appeal to you but anybody who's creating content and anybody who just wants to add a little extra um something to do when you're buying and working on your guns is create a log for each of your guns. Uh, in other words, either in a spreadsheet or ideally like in a three ring binder or something, just take some actual pieces of paper with a pen and a pencil. This will be some practice for actual human writing with your arms and hands and stuff. But, you know, make a page for each rifle or each handgun you got, whatever. And then put on there like when you bought it, where you bought it from, just some information for yourself. And I find it super neat. And it might not seem like that big a deal when you have two or three or six or 10 guns. But once you get more than a dozen and you have to try to remember, it takes a while usually to get a dozen. You know, you start to try to remember where all these things came from and uh, keeping track of where you got it, who you got it from, how much you spent on it. It's just interesting for yourself and potentially interesting in the future. But then keeping track on that log of when you clean it, it's super interesting. A lot of people don't bother with that kind of stuff, but it can be super useful in the future. Uh, how many rounds you shoot through it can be useful and just interesting for your own data. Your, your mind is going to get filled with lots of things over the years. And when you can go back and remind yourself, uh, there's something teach wise to, or there's something brain wise, when you take something and write it down on a piece of paper, you're, you're, you're hardwiring it into your brain. And then when you go back and look at it, it's different than if you just read something over and over, right? So there's something to writing this stuff down. Every time you get used to, or once you get into the habit, and not everybody does this, of course, this is rare. This is few people that do this. Competition people do this a lot. Some 
uh, gunsmiths do this, other nerds and stuff do this, but it's a great thing. And if you ever try it out, especially since we're talking to kids, it's something that it's a great habit to get into. So you keep this log and you keep track of how many rounds you're shooting, how often you clean the thing. And in this case, like Clover's saying, you put a bunch of accessories on there, put a note in there. You know, I bought this and such and such knob or rail or button or whatever. You take the old button off, the old rail or the old knob off. You put it in the package, like Clover said, keep the keep the receipts, keep the package, you know, whatever. But then put that on the shelf or in a thing somewhere. Now you've got your old part. You've got the package it came in and you've got your note as when you did that. And that, even if you're creating content, you know, that's content. You've just upgraded your gun. You cleaned your gun. You know, when you're starting out and you don't have a ton of stuff to play show and tell with, description of what your your process is is pretty neat. And you're going to be sharing that with others who are at your pace and your your level. And you're also sharing that with people that you know are, are yet to come. So that's super interesting. I haven't seen too many people pursue that. And if, like Clover says, something happens, you want to switch everything out, you can not only give them the original parts, but you'll have all your original packaging for those red parts or those blue parts or whatever. Um, so it's just another thing to throw at you. Consider keeping a log book and consider making notes of when you make those kind of upgrades years later, when you go to sell that gun, you know, and you uh, have a list you can give them. Here's every time I cleaned it. Here's every round that went through it. Um, if that person's making a debate, am I going to buy it from this guy or that guy? You might gain a couple of points when you can give them a pretty thorough history of that gun. Even if it's been thrashed, even if the gun's been used a lot, people can really appreciate, you know, something like that, a log book that goes along with it. Yep. Okay. So, um, Daniel was saying that they can, you can make an adapter at his shop. It's Allen Precision. You can hit him up on Instagram. Uh, they're a shop in Texas that uh, does machine work and definitely can handle like a custom plate or a specific plate for a combination that you can't find elsewhere. Um, now Boomstick is asking right now, why doesn't anyone make a 25 ACP rifle? Well, I'm guessing because the legal definition of rifle is like usually 16 something inches and that's a lot, lot to ask out of a 25 ACP. That's yeah. a lot of barrel length. A lot of drag lot of on the rifling, isn't it? Yeah, so even if you had almost no rifling, which would make it very inaccurate, right, and it would wear the gun out very easily, right? Normally, you want to have a, you want to hold on to that bullet and kind of force it out of there to get it accurate. Not force it, but you know, have some amount of friction. Um, the 25 ACP is not designed for that, so it was made for for small uh, pistol barrels. It just doesn't have enough oomph to get out of a rifle. Yep. If you shot, if you made a 25 ACP rifle, I would recommend always shooting it down. Right. Uh, let's see. So next up, uh, is it illegal for a brother to gift me a stripped lower receiver? Now, we don't have a lot of info here, so we're going to have to assume some things. But uh, is it illegal for a brother to gift me a stripped lower receiver? Uh, what, what I guess the easiest way is, or one way to start this is, what all aspects do we have to worry about as a factor? What state they're in? How old they are? Felons? What am I missing? Uh, yeah, whether or not you're a prohibited person, because that would include felons as well as underage. So whether or not you're a yeah, and and then the state that you live in, uh, that's the only two the only two caveats I can think of. It's definitely the two most important. And then, um, but is it illegal? No, I don't think so. It might be in some states if there is some kind of rule and like. We just said if you if you're not legal or one way or the other you want to be as illegal then no but uh, otherwise that's what property is for right is to uh share and to uh um, what's that called to well share i guess well trade yeah commerce it's all part of yeah it's all part of private property right now oh okay you know what another thing is across state lines so because of lower is could be a pistol I would think there might be an issue across state lines, and that's because in 1968, the Gun Control Act started to really crack down or create extra infringement on uh, individuals crossing state lines and transferring handguns. It doesn't matter with rifles. It might. Does, yeah, it does matter with rifles. What am I saying? So you can't transfer across state lines. You have, oh wait, you can do rifles across state lines. You can do rifles. That's what it's going to depend on. You've got you've got three classifications when you're talking about the FFL. 
when you're talking about the 4473. So, um, and when you when you throw the ATF into there, it, you know, they, look, they look at a few different factors. So, ATF is going to say, okay, how is this manufactured, right? So, did that whoever manufactured that lower, did they manufacture it as a rifle lower, pistol lower, or just a stripped lower, right? Which would be an other. Okay. And that would got, matter because in their book, when they wrote it and told the ATF, they're going to write it down as one of those three things. So right. they're going to. Right. And let me back up. It's, it's going to be long gun, handgun, and other. I said rifle and pistol. It's going to be long gun, handgun, and other. Then when it gets to the, uh, the, FFL, and then the person that's doing the gifting picks it up. What was it logged in as there? Was it logged in as, as handgun? If it was, then you've got a state line issue potentially. Uh, but if it was other or, or long gun, and most often the uh, strip lower is done as other. And there's, I've heard some stories out there of some shops that put strip lowers under handgun just because they're, that's the way they do it. They're weird and they're leery of things. Um, so they go handgun instead of other, but it, I've heard that story very, very few times over the years. Most dealers log it as other and you would be okay. I've heard it too, but it's like tradition more than legally. They just do that because of their shop like procedure yeah. more than any kind of law. Yeah. And then that just has to do with before there was a classification as other, which only exists because of AR lowers. Before there was that, there was only long gun and pistol or handgun. Right. And if you put something in as a long gun and people used it as a pistol, you were in trouble. Right. And if you put something in as a pistol and some use it as a rifle, that wasn't conflicting with any national laws. So people would almost always put their receivers in as pistols. Yeah. Which really screwed with stuff when they started worrying about braces and classifications of what accessories go on pistols versus rifles yep. crazy yeah you can have a ar-15 lower receiver classified as a pistol because it was before the days of the other and have it turned into a rifle just configured always has been a rifle and then anyway yeah there's potentially some weird stuff so is it illegal for a brother to gift me a strip lower there's a couple of three caveats there but most of the time we can safely say no but hesitantly because there are some caveats there. Yeah, definitely check your state regulations for sure. So now Richard's saying, is this Richard from England? I found some good looking Red Dawn shirts here in the UK this week. I did send you a link on Friday so I could have so you could have a look, but somebody blocked it. So I don't know what that means, what blocked it or whatever. Sorry about that. If somebody blocked it on the channel, I don't know. I guess I have mods. I don't know why they would do that. It might have been inadvertent. I know that. It has happened to me. I've watched stuff on phones and walking from my bedroom into here, it has clicked on somebody and almost blocked them. You know, like when you're watching a video and you're in the chat on a phone, I, you know, my finger or something touched the screen and it was all set up to block somebody. And I it didn't luckily, and I was able to back out of it, but I literally was only holding the phone. I wasn't even touching the screen. So it's definitely easy for somebody to inadvertently do that. So I apologize if that happened. I don't think anybody would have intentionally done it. And then you've also got anytime you're dropping links, even if you are a moderator, links are one thing that YouTube is super, super, super hesitant about because of the amount of the massive amount of overwhelming amount of spam and whatnot that happens on a platform. So they're real iffy when it comes to links anyway. So they, it could have been an automated thing. Oh, that's true. Usually it'll tell you, but yeah, it could have been. And maybe because of international link too. Well, let's see. What stops a nine millimeter round, everything, in the proper place in the chamber of a nine millimeter or similar round with no lip? Oh my goodness. Let's try to figure this one out. How do I get this thing to just, oh, there you go. What stops a nine millimeter round in the proper place in a chamber of a nine millimeter or similar round with no lip on the back? I think they mean a rim or a neck down area in front. So a neck. Revolver rounds have the lip that sticks out in the back, so it's obvious for those, not so obvious with a round. So they're asking, how does a semi-auto round headspace? So the word for proper place in the chamber is headspace. There you go. So, yeah. You want to answer it? I go ahead. So basically, the headspace off of that tiny, tiny gap, that tiny little lip between the bullet and the, the case. So the end of the case is important. The case length is important. And that's when they say a headspace gauge or whatever, or case length measuring gauge, um, because that's important. That'll um, 
that's where it headspace is on every semi-auto round. So they, you're right, they're smooth, or at least, you know, if you looked at them from the side, the side of the wall of the uh, case is often the same, or sometimes even more. Some of the semi-auto rounds, the rims are even, what do they call that when it's, it's less right. diameter? Than rebated. The it's re rebated. Rebated rims, yeah. And that's probably so they eject better. They can have a stronger yep. ejector. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so basically that's a great question and it's not necessarily obvious. And because of that, the awesome Medusa revolver was able to head space off the case and off of the rim. So it was able to chamber a whole bunch of different rounds in the 30 caliber right. uh, diameter. And that's, that's a, a, it's a good point too with that question to bring up because I know a lot of people that shoot 40 caliber stuff in, in their 10 millimeter. And while you can do that, I know people that also shoot 380 in a nine millimeter Makarov. And here's the thing, while you can do that, you're not talking about the same length case. So obviously it's not head spacing. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not head spacing on the case mouth because it's not using that alternative shorter cartridge. There's not long enough. So while it will technically feed and work and fire, uh, you're putting a whole lot of emphasis because it can't head space because it's simply not long enough on the case mouth. It essentially is head spacing off of the extractor. That makes sense. The extractor is your point that stops that from going deeper or shallow, right? Oh, and, it kind and of catches so, it like a hook or whatever, yeah. Right. And so if you have a situation where you break an extractor uh, or, you know, you've got an extractor issue, then you potentially can have an ad, out of battery uh incident and firing out a battery is not good and the same with a bad or ruptured case or some kind of flaw in the yes. case and the mm -hmm. case rips then the ejector can be okay but then the same consequences the, the right. case the cartridge will be all out of whack or where anywhere when it actually goes off right and that's the thing that the reason i always point that out is when i got my glock 20 um a buddy of mine had had one for many 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 years uh, all he has ever shot is 40 in his. And he's like, oh, yeah, shoot 40. Da, da, da. And I don't know how many boxes of 40 I shot before one time somebody told me that. And I'm like, you know, that makes sense. And then I got to researching it. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know that I want to shoot any more 40 in my. <laughs> and it's 40. I don't like 40 anyway. So, um, you know, went to, went to shooting straight up 10 millimeter. In it. And, uh, you know, thankfully, I didn't have any issues. He's never had any issues. To my knowledge, he's still shooting 40 in his, uh, in his Glock 20s. But, um, yeah, just just know that it, it everything doesn't mesh up the way it's supposed to mechanically mesh up. So the potential for issues is there. I never even thought about that. We have a ten, and we've never shot forty out of it. Now I'm wondering. It's not mine right now. It's one of those guns we trade while we sell back and forth when one of us has money. Uh -huh. and I don't own it right now, but I don't want to do it when I don't own it. I think I own it. I have possession of it, but I technically don't own it. You know, it's like right. Yeah, but anyway, that's you shouldn't have said that because now I'm gonna run around my head wanting to do that. Um, dang, there was something else I was gonna say, and I lost it when I started saying that. So uh, Richard was saying it was blocked when we were live, and he's gonna send it to Tony who'll pass it on. So thanks for that. Um, dang it, you were talking about how the ten millimeter or the forty and the ten. Oh, well, whatever. So, um, oh, I guess, you know what I was going to say is it's, it's kind of off topic, but it brought it up and I'd never heard this before. So Smith and Wesson revolvers, the old ones had a recessed uh, chamber. In other words, that rim that we're talking about on a revolver ca cartridge, uh, that was kind of, what would you call that, chamfered in or you know, uh, cut in so that the right. back in, of the rim. Inlet, inlet, I think would be the proper term. Okay, and then that way, the, the when you looked at it, was almost like putting a, the the rounds into a a, a length gauge because right. you know when you look at the back of the revolver cylinder, it was flush. Nowadays, they just cut the back of the revolver cylinder flat, and the key and the rims all headspace, and then the rims are all sticking out. Right, they're kind of lumpy on the back when you look at it sideways. There, if that makes sense to people. So, yeah. I always was told by everybody who I ever known that they quit doing that because of cost, that it costs too much to go through that machining process. Turns out that's wrong. Do you know the real reason why they stopped putting recessed cylinders on the Smith & Wessons? 
No, I mean, I would have, the cost would make total sense to me, but it makes sense. I mean, they were sure happy to be able to not do it, but it turns out, and I learned this off the Johnny Rowland shooting show, which is an awesome show. Everybody should pay homage to the original gun or content creator, I think, or awesome gun content creator, at least. So it turns out back in the day, cartridges were made by extruding and smooshing. So you had sort of a mushroom shape. Imagine extruding, you know, 44, uh, 44 Magnum, extruding it, smushing it down. So the end is sort of a mushroomed whatever. And imagine what would happen inside of there. You'd have like a little weird Oreo with air in the middle, right? But it was all smashed together and nobody cared. But that's why they would recess the cylinders because in case there was ever a blowout at the edge of the rim, it would not be as big as a deal or whatever. Uh, and whenever they stopped the cleaning, yeah, exactly. And that would happen, I guess, especially with magnums and stuff, because they were all experimenting with magnums. And before that, it wasn't a lot of pressure, so it was no big deal. Well, at some point, the cartridge companies are like, let's quit getting sued. So let's make our cases with a solid thing at the bottom, right, where the rim is now. If you cut a rim in half, there's a uh, area. So when yep. they started doing that, and modern cases are all like that now, they were like, oh, we don't have to make that recess anymore. So, yeah, it was a cost thing wow. but because the ammo changed. And I never thought of that. And that's super yeah. cool. Thanks, Johnny Roland, whoever it was. It was a guest that talked about that. So I didn't know that. Um, that's interesting. I mean, I, it, with all of the conversations I've had with my antique ammo guy and stuff, I mean, that's never come up. But um, that makes but that makes total sense. But hollow case head versus solid, solid case head. I knew that was a thing. I just never put two and two together with revolvers and why you would do that. It makes total sense. Yeah, and they only had to do that because of like Almer and people making 44 Magnum, 357 Magnums. They started blowing those edges out. Before that, everything was wimpy. You know, nine millimeter never blew nothing out. So you never need to right. do nothing. So it's neat. Yeah, anyway, I thought that was kind of not really on topic, but on topic. All right. So I don't know how many more of these we're going to do. We're at 37 minutes. Give us some feedback out there. I guess I can do a poll and say, how long should we go? And then I'll say like something like number of questions or like length of time. And just ask the community. All right. So again, we're going to ask quest askgunquestions.com. It's a website that we've had up since 2007. Uh, you know, we're gunwebsites.com. Back when I first started playing around on the internet, I had a big uh, it was a big deal to grab cool websites, you know, cool domain names while they were available. Uh, so I own things like gunwebsites.com, right? I own things like uh, uh, guncalendars.com and then askgunquestions.com. So I like to do something with them. Oh, I also own turninyourgun.com just so that no jerk owns it, right? And uh, askgunquestions.com has been a form uh, since 2007 where all you have to do is ask a question and then if you want to, you can put a name. And if you want to, you can put a link, like if you need to, for some reason to qualify the question or something. But it's on Google Form, so it removes all the spam. And it takes all those questions and puts them in a list over here. And that's what we're reading. So people uh, post these things. And uh, we're reading them right now. OK, so then, uh, yeah, that's fine. Wait, hold on. What time is it? Yeah, that'll work. So. Um, We'll go to, I was going to say at some point, we're going to switch and go from the most recent ones to some of the back ones. So yeah, that's we right. can just dig in, right? I mean, they're kind of all random anyway. I just, oh, you know what? And I'm also going to start putting in uh, this so that I know which ones we've already read. I'll make these green since I'm reading them with Clover. Um, and what I did here was just highlight the cells that we've already and then I change the background color using the spreadsheet that they're in. Um, so let's see. Oh, so this last one was, can I constitutional carry with a drug charge? So I guess to qualify it, it will be depending on the state. And I guess, I don't know if it makes a difference beyond that, but that's the first thing I think of is depends on the state because not every state has constitutional carry. Something like 22 of them now do though. Yep. So I'm guessing no. Uh, depending on no matter what the charge is, if you're a felon, you cannot legally own a gun and constitutional carry simply says, if you can legally own a gun, then you can carry it how you want. So there's that qualifier. So if you're a felon and you can't own a gun, then constitutional carry does not apply to you. If you're a 
drug charge that's been what's it called when they remove it adjudicated um, or it could be a misdemeanor as well drug charge. and then and that might be a quality right that might be different here's what i'd recommend is call the lawyer in your state there's got to be one and and ask the question right yeah um yeah. here in arizona uh we've got mark uh walters and no is it mark vickers mark victors up in in phoenix who's sort of state known statewide and for decades now as being let's call him a gun lawyer he shows up at the big gun shows and puts up a booth he has uh seminars live for everyone to talk about things like constitutional carry and uh, ccw and when you're stopped i mean he just offers free seminars he's a great guy he offers a lot of uh, content on the various social platforms and uh I'm sure that most states have somebody or maybe even multiple lawyers like that. Uh, but that's uh, an interesting one. And I'm wondering, um, you know, what kind of drug charge, too? Because if we're talking the marijuana ones, I think, don't they change some of those once the states change? I think they remove some of those. And I don't know if that means it removes it from your, like they let people out of jail, right? And I don't know if that means they remove it from your record or if the government. Well, there's, that. yeah, I mean, there's multiple caveats to that. So it's like if it was expunged, expu and, and thanks to Roy out there for that. If it's expunged, that's as if it never happened, right? But usually to be expunged, that's a process you have to go through. It doesn't just automatically expunge. So let's say they change the law and they say, hey, here's a mechanism for us to, you know, basically you contact the attorney general or whoever and they go through and they remove it. Right. Um, there's a process that you initiate. You go through to make sure that it gets expunged. Uh, then you got adjudication where it's like it, it happened, but it only affected you while it was under a certain amount of time or something. Right. But it did happen. There's record that it's, it happened. Uh, and that record doesn't get removed. So there's, there's varying legal nuance to it. Um, and yeah, depending on your state, you definitely want to check, but you're absolutely right. I mean, for the most part, if you can't go fill out a 4473 buy a firearm from a uh, dealer currently, then constitutional carry does not apply to you. Is I think that's the that's uh, a really the, good. Yeah, that's a really good hard and fast rule to go by. Yeah, that's the best way to say it. Is that's because you can't just say if you can buy a gun because you can almost always just buy a gun from like your brother right. or something. Right. But, well, you're, uh, well, you're not supposed to, but yeah. Well, I said can. Yeah, not should or legally able to or legally whatever. Not able, but I guess right. legally allowed to or whatever words would be. Um, so here, I'm going to go. There are a couple of new ones that came in. I'm going to intentionally blow those off. And if you've got a real problem with that, let me know, because in the future, I plan to do this one every Saturday, and uh, at least for a while here, see what people think of it. And uh, if you'd rather, I do the ones that you ask live. live. And otherwise, I'm just trying to leave those, so I bank them for next week, basically. Yeah. So we're going to go back in, just grab some randomly. Or how about this, Clover? You got a number between like 100 and 300 or 100 and 600? Let's do 177. So that gets us to some place to start off. Uh, I have a another legal one. I have a misdemeanor. Let's see how I get that to show up. I guess that's it. I have a mis nope. I have a misdemeanor that would have been a felony, but I was a minor. Why can't I get my CCW? And what do I do to fix this? Oh wow. Well. Yeah, we don't know anything about the details. So I think, again, going back to a general thing, um, yeah, you got to get a lawyer. There's no way I would ask a gun shop. No one's going to know unless they happen to have known somebody with a very similar situation. You're going to want to go to a lawyer. And then would you consider asking like three lawyers, something like this, so that you'd figure out what's consistent? Probably. Yeah, probably. I mean, the, the thing there is it says that it wasn't a felony because he was a minor, correct? No, it says that he had a felon. It, no, he says he got a misdemeanor that would have been a felony, but because he was a minor, it was only a misdemeanor. And now he can't get his CCW. Right. But again, I have no idea what the state's requirements are for CCW. Yeah. And, but domestic abuse, domestic violence, or whatever it's called. Yeah, uh, that's true. I should say, doesn't matter where you are. That's always going to be treated as a felony. Basically. Yep. 
it's, yeah, there are certain mis there are certain misdemeanors that are going to be out of bounds. Um, that being an issue where uh, you're dealing with a minor, the play there more than likely, and it is going to require a lawyer or at least uh, a legal avenue. Uh, is to get those, you know, all of those records with you as a minor to have all that sealed. That's interesting. So um, I guess I forgot this one over here. Uh, we're going to hit these since they're live. Uh, 25 AC. Oh, this is just, a, this is adding to the question about 25 and a rifle. 25 ACP or boomstick says 25 ACP has an average feet per second of 750 to 900. CCI quiet 22 LR is 710. 380 sounds or 380 rounds start at a little over 950. Both work in carbines and rifle. I think a 22 a 25 ACP carbine might work. Okay, well I didn't realize the. Well, it makes sense. I mean, 25's got to be bigger than 22, but we're also talking a 25 more surface area, more friction. So. Yeah. Just because they got the power doesn't mean it can have the oomph for that particular. And then the grains are going to be bigger. I don't know what the math comes out to, but yep. I'm guessing the reason we don't see 25. Well, you know what, though? Here's the deal. I, I'm not going to petition against it. I just assume that it doesn't work because we don't see any 25 ACP carbines. But here's the thing. Number one, we need a center fire 25 ACP version of a 1919. A belt fed 25 ACP Full go. auto tripod mounted belt cloth cloth belt. It looks awesome when they're cloth belts. That has to exist. One of the main reasons to get rid of the NFA is for tiny machine guns, which are amazingly fun. Yeah. And then we need to see a 25 ACP cricket. That would be awesome. A, a, a center fire cricket or Savage Baby, whatever it's called, or whatever the model. They need to make youth rifles in 25 ACP. Having a, a center fire tiny 25 ACP that you could reload instead of stupid 22s. I'm now changing my mind completely. I demand, I demand that we start getting 25 ACP crickets. Little kids could have little reloading presses that reload the 25 ACP and think about all the cartridges. I mean, not cartridges, projectiles that could come out for 25 ACP. Wow, that would be awesome. Magazines would be super cool. Yes, I think 20, and well, I'm all okay with 32 ACP, but 25 ACP, the dimensions of it, are just amazing. I think 25 ACP is the coolest little looking cartridge. 32 ACP is basically a scale down 45, right? Yeah. And I mean, that's neat, but well, I guess it is a little bit longer. Oh, how about ammo? There we go. So it's a little bit more like a 20, like a 45. So I think that the 25. Oh, come on, ammo. I'm going to go to pistols first. That makes no sense to me. So where can I find just a raw? See how it's a little bit longer? I think that would turn itself into a tiny rifle and it's not really rim fire. Is that a rebated rim? What are they? I don't know what they call it particularly. That, rimless. But it's just plain old rimless. It just looks weird because it's such a tiny case that, yeah. yeah. So um, anyway, I think that's a little bit cooler than this one's a little bit fatter, but I don't know. I could be talked into a 32, I suppose. I just think 25 is a little bit cooler and 25, ammo would fit into all the little uh, ring of fire guns and stuff. Um, so yeah, I'm changing my mind. I'm demanding a 25 ACP bolt action. I demand a, a, you know, a bell fed 25 ACP machine gun. Um, and then whatever guns you guys want, 25 ACP, I'm down for. Uh, we've got a couple more minutes. So we had another one that came in uh, from here. I have a seven millimeter, this is from Backwoods Basin. I have a seven millimeter Remington Magnum, so massive rifle. It's seven hundred A. That's the bolt action giant cartridge. Is that the long? It's got to be the long action, mm -hmm. right? Um, without a magazine well, is it worth changing that or putting money into? I want to take it out to a thousand yards. So without a magazine well, I didn't know that. I guess what is that an option or is that just different models? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Different so why would you make a one with a single shot versus uh, usually they have like three or five round mag for hunting? Well, I mean, that's what he, no, it, it doesn't have, he's saying it doesn't have the detachable box magazine. So um, the 700 so have mag anyway, it just doesn't have it. It's internal. Or, yeah. Yeah. The, the 700s have, you know, varying models and one 
of them is basically your hunting model, which does not. And that's because of different state laws and hunting laws in different states, hunting regulations, let's say, uh, in uh, different states and stuff like that is, is part of why. But, um, yeah, I mean, the action, the I mean, everything else is going to be virtually identical. So, you know, if you're talking about pimping it out for something long range, I mean, you've got the barrel in the action and that's the main part. So, you know, you start going with the chassis and going with some other stuff and you can do whatever you want as far as the uh, magazine goes. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, that's not my forte or nothing. And certainly not a seven millimeter Remington Magnum. That's Gorgeous. a huge, that's a huge belted round, isn't it? That's huge. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's for like elk or reindeer or something huge. And uh, what are those things called? Um, anyway, I don't, yep. that's not my forte. But as far as seven or 700 Remington, wait, this, what's the rifle? A 700? Remington yeah. 700, right? Then, yeah. uh, I think there's a whole lot of snobs out there that would go, oh, and they would put up their nose like that's a economy gun or something. I don't know that particular model, but I personally, like back when I was a kid, that was the go to. Right. So I thought it was cool. And I think, I don't know, I consider it like the muscle car of gun of bolt actions. It's not the coolest high tech ultra whiz, like whatever, you know, doing uh, that's. That's a pretty that's a pretty standard status quo hunting rifle. Uh, yeah, between, it, pretty that it's way. solid, right. strong, right? It's just that yeah. there are going to be snobs that are like, "Oh, you need a skeletonized, lightweight, blah yeah. blah." Well, so, that's what I was. That's what I was fixing to say. I mean, you could take that. I mean, talking about putting money in it to go out to a thousand yards. All you need is glass. Quite honestly, I mean, it, well, no, that's the thing. A thousand yards isn't hard for a Remington Seven Hundred. That's within its capability easily, right? It's just a matter of you get good enough to keep up with it. Right. I mean, you, you might, design. you might want to, uh, you know, if you're talking a stock rifle, you might want to invest in a trigger, or you know, maybe send it off. You know, have have some gunsmithing done. You might want to uh, get the action, you know, blueprinted. I mean, there's some little things you could do like that with the rifle as it sits. But as far as the magazine, what's weird about that question is it's like, I want to take it out to a thousand yards and it's like, it doesn't have a detachable magazine. And it's like, so I've got, I've got rifles that, uh, that do have detachable magazines and I literally shoot them single shot when I shoot long range. So, you know, I, I load literally one round at a time. Um, so it, it really doesn't matter. Yeah, unless that matters to the model or something. But I would think without a magazine would be a stronger stock just because you've got an extra hole in it. Right. Um, I would say it, it actually, in contrast to what Clover said, all the things that Clover said are things that can be done to a rifle. But in order to know what your rifle needs, uh, I would say invest in a class. What was that class you guys went to for long range there in Texas? Uh, that was um, Charlie Mike Precision. So I'd invest in something like that. What was that, like a one day or a weekend? It was and a they weekend, two day, yeah. And, and they take you through a range of different scenarios and situations, test you and educate you. And then once you got an idea of what you're capable of and what you, you know, and plus you get it like a real good experience to experience stuff like, oh, I really want to shoot a thousand yards. Once you figure out it's kind of boring to shoot a thousand yards because it's all concentration and this and that yeah. it might be like, you know what, I'd rather shoot action or something. So anyway, doing some instruction like that or doing some kind of training, then that's what I'd recommend. And then once you get done, you might be like, oh, yeah, this is exactly what I was wanting. Now I know a little bit more than I knew before. Now I definitely want that trigger before I want the stock job or vice versa, or I want the optic before I work on the gun or whatever it is. You're going to have some like, you know, in, insight to what you want to do. All right. Plus, it's a lot of fun. You're also going to meet people at a class who are so hardcore that they paid money to go there. And that means you're going to be able to chat with them, shoot their guns, figure out that it's all optics, it's all glass, it's all glass, it's all glass, at least in my opinion. But, uh, okay, so then we're getting close. So, let's see. I think it would be cool for 32. Should have made it clear that is that platform worth working on. I use it for whitetail. Yeah, I think so. I'm a big fan of it. I just I just would tell you that you're definitely going to get people that will tell you to throw it away and start over with something different. Uh, yeah, I guess I figured he was just adding that as a model clarifier. Yeah. All right, cool. So that was kind of fun. That was our introductory uh, Ask Gun Questions uh, 2021 rewind or whatever. 
So we've got the website. It continually gets questions from all around the world on all different kinds of stuff, as you see. Um, I don't really like to dig in and mine. I used to do that, you know, back in the day. And it's just kind of boring. So I'd rather kind of just wing it like, like this. Maybe we'll use the randomizer to pick some uh, questions for us. And then we'll keep scooping up the most recent ones that come in. And because they're all over the place, we never know what we'll find out. So thanks, Clover, for joining us. Uh, you got anything to plug? You got anything coming up? Oh, uh, no, not a whole lot. Working on getting the um, uh, representative Matt Schaefer, who authored the Constitutional Carry Bill here in Texas, uh, trying to finalize getting him on a podcast. But other than that, not a lot. Well, thanks again for jumping in. It is the end of the comment period for the redefinition of firearms. I'll go back and add a link to the comment period if you're interested in participating in that. There's a big push on the uh, Pro infringement side to uh, to muddy the waters and to add comments over there, so we could our site can definitely use all the effort that people can muster. Uh, sharing that uh, uh, that challenge uh, is probably worth it. It ends Thursday, so we have a big push on that. Otherwise, let's see. Later on today, you've got G twenty three going live. You've got um, a barbecue will go live. After that. Uh, I think somebody's on after that. Then we've got uh, Gizzard in the morning and Locked and Loaded Latinos tomorrow afternoon. And we'll be back with this show again next Saturday. All right, thanks for watching. Oh, let me put a closer in here. I don't have one for Clover, so we'll go with one for G23. Shortest commercial ever was the first one I did, and I didn't realize time was a thing. All right, thanks everybody for showing up. We'll be back to pick you up later. Thank you for supporting our projects. If you'd like to buy us a cup of coffee, check out our Patreon channel. The guys and gals at gunwebsites.com encourage you to take a CCW class every year, practice at least once a month, and carry every day. Thank you for watching gunwebsites.com. Do, 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 do.